Hello, my name is Brian. Today we will examine democracy, its historical roots, different forms, and relationship to the most important concept of this course, citizenship. After being exiled multiple times with his clan and with the city of Athens continually falling in and out of tyranny, Cleisthenes, the father of Athenian democracy, goes to the Oracle of Delphi and asks her to help him persuade the Spartans to overthrow the tyrant Hippias, running Athens at the time. He is granted this wish, and when he assumes power in Athens, he makes major changes to the government, which then becomes the foundational roots of democracies of the future. Faced with infighting between tribes and a messy governmental system given to tribal squabbling and a corrupt control by a wealthy elite, he artificially reorganized the tribes into ten new tribes, based on geographical areas they occupied rather than by old tribal affiliation, this which formed the basis for modern representative districts. He also expanded the assembly responsible for enacting laws into force, the Ecclesia, to 500 members, and then had 50 members from each new tribe act as representatives. He also reorganized the courts and randomly selected jurors from the general public to ensure fairness, as well as reforming the law-drafting tribunal known as the Boule. The Bool drafted bills that each citizen would vote on to determine whether an idea actually became a law. To become a member of the Bool, one first had to pass an examination, called the Dokimasia, or investigation, in which one's general background was explored in order to find out if the candidate was indeed worthy of the post, somewhat similar to the election process of the U.S. The Bool were also asked to take the Buletic Oath, an oath stating that they would create laws solely for the betterment of the people of Athens. Cleisthenes had his ecclesia meet up to 40 times a year. The point of all these reforms was to prevent the control of Athens by a wealthy few, or an aristocracy, by establishing the citizen as the source of political power by which government officials were pledged to an oath of honor to serve, and were in fact citizens themselves. The story of Athenian democracy tells us the importance of citizenship in maintaining a democracy. The word democracy itself comes from two Greek words, demos meaning person or whole citizen, and kratos meaning power, power to rule. Cleisthenes' reforms and subsequent reforms to Athenian democracy were designed to center government within the political life of the citizen, rather than a powerful few or wealthy elite. To act required the will of the many, thus a citizen must understand himself as a political being gifted with a natural right to decide the direction of society. Throughout Western democracy, three main forms of democracy emerged, direct, pluralist, and representative. In this lesson, we will examine these different forms and the way modern democratic nations combine different aspects of each to create a government of the people, often for the people, but not always by the people. Let's look at types of democracy. Imagine your family is planning a vacation and some people want to go to the beach, but others want to go to the mountains. How would you decide? Let's say everyone writes their choice down and puts it in a hat. The option with the most votes wins. Essentially, direct democracy is meant to work just like that. Simple majority rules. Now, I know what you're thinking. What if there's a tie? And that, my friends, is where things get complicated. As we can see, direct democracy works best in small settings and local communities. In America, this form was most common in New England towns where citizens voted on proposed laws. These are called popular assemblies, similar to the Athenian Ecclesia. The larger a community becomes, the more difficult it gets. Many democratic nations use direct democracy as a set of tools to maintain the citizen as the source of political life and power rather than the overall structure of the government. Today, these tools come as referendums in which the citizen votes directly on a proposed law rather than elected officials. These typically involve major issues such as education or health care. Citizen initiatives is another common tool which allows the citizen to propose rather than just vote on a law. 
Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is having the right to gather or assemble and protest for change. When citizens come together, their individual political power is multiplied and can create a force for change. Together, citizens can organize themselves and better use the direct democratic tools. The next type of democracy is pluralism. The ability to gather allows citizens to organize themselves into groups on a mission. This one is easy to see and is very common. Are you a part of any clubs or associations? Maybe you or your parents are members of a political party or a professional group, such as a teacher's union. Other associations fight for certain changes to laws, such as Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Pluralism also allows for corporations to come together and lobby politicians for favorable legislation. These are private citizens that attempt to influence political agendas in campaigns rather than support a candidate. Essentially, pluralism says that within a democracy, there are multiple interests which compete over the direction of the nation or the community. Some societies construct governments which enforce a single view or interests over society such as a religious code. Today, some nations still use Sharia law as a system which, instead of seeking compromise to the many competing views, enforces a single perspective over the numerous interests which typically exist in any society. We will look more at this in another lesson, and specifically at the impact of pluralism on democracy and its citizens later in the class. The third form of democracy is called representative. Have you ever voted for a class president or maybe selected someone else to represent you? Most democratic nations use a representative system as the basis for the structure of government. Some use a parliamentary system in which a prime minister or the chief executive, like our president, is selected from the majority party in parliament, the lawmaking group of that government. The citizens vote on the members of parliament, but not on the prime minister. The other main form is a presidential system, in which the citizens vote from members of a lawmaking body, Congress, and the president, either directly or indirectly. I'm pretty sure you can see where this might go wrong as well. Representative democracy creates what our founders called a republic, a government in which supreme power resides in a body of citizens entitled to vote and is exercised by elected officers and representatives responsible to them and governing according to law. Remember, the larger a community becomes, especially a nation, the more difficult democratic decision-making gets. Nation-states tend to be representative democracy because it eases the efficiency in which decisions are made. Do me a favor. Close your eyes and imagine getting everyone in your neighborhood, town, or city together in one room. I know, it's a very impressively large room. Ask them whether they want to raise taxes on gas or sales or anything, really, in order to fund some wonderful project, such as building a town ice cream stand. Can you guess how difficult it would be? Representative democracy can make a decision much more efficiently, but what about the giant plastic company that wants to build next to your playground? Well, that's where pluralism can corrupt representatives. Again, we have to go back to the citizen as the source of political life and power. Let's look at some of the issues with representative democracy. In a previous lesson, we learned about the relationship between government and markets. Remember, government acts as a mediator between the market and other social arrangements, such as families, business, and churches. Today, democracies have to manage capitalism, which can tend to create conflicts of interest in government through lobbyist and political campaign contributions. This can cause conflicts in a society. Also, it means you, as a citizen, must represent you and your community's interest. That's why those tools of direct democracy are so important. Within a representative democracy that has all sorts of pluralist characteristics, there must be something which enables the citizen to hold its government accountable to the people, for the people, and by the people. These tools give you a seat at the table. They ensure you have a say in those essential questions that all markets ask. What to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. Democracy means you are responsible for your community. Do you want a new factory in your town that could bring thousands of jobs? Do you want a mine opening up near your favorite river or park? What is the lowest someone should earn as a wage today? 
Should companies have access to your digital data? Should we trade with a nation that allows young children to work in an industrial factory? Democracy is an attempt at centering the answers to those questions with you and your fellow citizens. However, we can see that it must employ all those forms. Otherwise, for if it were only representative, it can easily slip into the next type of political system, authoritarianism. It, as all nation-states do, say that citizens are the source of political power, but unlike democracy, it builds hollow institutions to simply pretend, or skips the makeup and simply rules with an iron fist. For your benefit, of course. So, let's recap. You are a citizen. To make democracy truly democratic, you need certain tools. Maybe we call these rights. Washington once said, If the freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent we may be led, like sheep, to the slaughter. Democracies can become slow and decision-making difficult due to so many interests, or the power of some interests over others, and representatives that fail to truly represent. But because you have rights, citizens remain the center of political life. However, only if each citizen stays informed, active, and always guards their ability to sit at the table. And that's why we always say, remember to vote, debate, and participate. Hey!